Okay, I guess we might as well get started um, uh, with this session. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Henricks. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Styra and one of the co-creators of the Open Policy Agent Project. Um, so uh, I'm glad you could make it. Um, today, what we're going to be talking a little bit about is how to simplify uh, using the Open Policy Agent, uh, which gives you sort of a unified solution to authorization across your cloud native ecosystem uh, by using uh, Styra's uh, uh, control plane management plane, single pane of glass, it was designed to work directly with OPA. And we call that the Declarative Authorization Service or DAS for short. All right, so the sort of starting point for all of this is uh, the basic idea that uh, there are so many organizations today that are embracing cloud and cloud native uh, uh, developer processes and, and software solutions that um, what everybody's also doing is embracing in large part a new software stack, right? So it's not the LAMP stack of the old days, really it's this new stack that we're trying to, trying to draw here for you. Uh, so this is sort of our canonical picture of the modern way to, to build and deploy and run uh, software applications in a cloud and cloud native way. Uh, and so what you'll notice here is that there are all the kinds of uh, uh, components that you're used to, right? So CI CD pipelines, uh, you've got the, the platform uh, that the CI CD pipeline is deploying your applications to. By platform here, I'm talking public cloud or, or maybe you're using uh, Kubernetes as well. Uh, and then there's the application that's running on top of the, the platform. And on that, in that application, obviously you've got all the usual components of you know, front ends and back ends um, and, and databases. Um, and what, what we're also seeing a bunch of people do is think about uh, the perspective that uh, a lot of these applications are architected in a microservice, uh, in a microservice way. And so uh, what we kind of see is that this is a major trend uh, that, that's happening all throughout industry. Everybody's embracing these new software stacks. Uh, and so the observation that we made at the very uh, beginning of, of when we founded the company was that there are authorization problems that happen at each and every layer of this software stack. Uh, so if you think about like a CI CD pipeline, you're thinking about, you know, can this user deploy this application on, onto this platform? At the microservice level, um, the authorization problem that you encounter are, well, a microservice just received an API call. Is that API call authorized to be evaluated or not? At the database level, every time somebody tries to query a production database, let's say, um, you know, is that is that query authorized? Is it authorized to be run at all? Is it authorized to be to be changing or, or reading from that table or that row or that column? Um, those are all authorization decisions that need to be made. Um, at the at the container management level, uh, there every time somebody tries to a, a developer tries to spin up a new pod or new ingress, uh, a new daemon set on on Kubernetes, you know, is that is that um, is that resource configured safely? Is it authorized to be deployed onto, uh, onto that cluster? Uh, at the public cloud layer, we see very similar kinds of, of authorization problems that we see at the Kubernetes layer. There, they're just more specific to the public cloud resources. So is this public S3 bucket, is that authorized? Or um, um, you know, can, can we deploy you know, whatever EC2 instances outside of VPCs? Um, and then at the at the server level, we've always had authorization challenges there, which is like who can who can actually connect, who can SSH to these servers, right? And and people still think about that today. So anyway, there are authorization problems at every layer of the stack. And so the observation we made in the very early days is not only does author authorization exist everywhere, but um, it's all implemented uh, sort of differently at each and every layer of the stack. So if you've got fifty seven different uh, products uh, or projects, uh, they all have a different way of solving uh, that authorization problem. And so when I think of authorization, I like to think about it as having these two components or, or two categories of authorization, roughly speaking. Uh, there's sort of platform level authorization, uh, which is, is really where we're talking about, you know, the platform, the cloud, the, the CI CD pipeline. Um, uh, and then secondly, there's the application uh, part of authorization, which is obviously more focused on the apps that are running on top of those platforms. And these two kinds of authorization seem to have some, some different characteristics to them. And, and, but that helps me, I think, organize that, that, that last slide mentally to, to sort of understand what kinds of authorization we're talking about. And here today, we're gonna to talk about really all those different kinds of authorization, but, but, but a couple of categories uh, makes things a little bit clearer. 
So, uh, like I said, the, the sort of challenge in this authorization, um, uh, the challenge of authorization is that there are so many different kinds, so many different solutions to authorization that if I, as a user, am trying to understand who has access to what, or, or if I want to change and implement some security compliance or operational policy, um, I need to think about and understand all those 57 different products that I have, all the different GUIs, all the different APIs, even all the different models. Each product seems to have its own model for how you think about uh, authorization. Uh, and so all those, all those challenges end up becoming problematic, especially as you see more and more teams growing um, and, and, you, and bringing in more and more different kinds of software. And so um, at Styro, we, we, we decided to tackle this problem head on. And the first piece of software that we built to help address it is called the Open Policy Agent Project. So this is an, an entirely open source project that we donated to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But the goal of OPA is to provide a unified solution to authorization across this cloud native ecosystem. So, um, you know, the, the idea being that OPA provides a, a, a unified policy language for expressing policies. It provides a, an engine that can be um, hopefully easily integrated into all these different kinds of software so that um, those software systems can ask uh, that policy engine for decisions. Um, and then uh, there's a bunch of tooling as well around, you know, unit testing, uh, profiling, uh, debugging uh, to help the policy authors not only write policies, but also make sure that they are saying what they think they say. Um, and so that's what OPA provides. Um, this slide I like for a couple of reasons, one of which is that it, it does give you at a, at a, at a glance um, the different kinds of uh, policy problems that OPA has been applied to solve in production by at least somebody in the world. So, you know, each and every one of these uh, of those of those categories of use cases that we talked about a little bit ago, CI CD pipelines, uh, microservices, applications, databases, Kubernetes, uh, public cloud with Terraform, um, and, and even Linux um, are, are, are areas where our, our classes of authorization problems that OPA has been deployed to solve in production at scale. And so that this is a, you know, sort of a bird's eye view of the different use cases for which people have applied OPA. Um, but the other reason I like this slide is because it kind of sh also shows architecturally how OPA was designed. So one of the things that uh, that I'm sure most of the folks on the call realize is that uh, in this modern age of cloud native, uh, there are a couple of design principles that are pretty important uh, and, and that apply especially to authorization. So one of which is that um, you know authorization is something that needs to be made all the time, right? Every single API, let's say, that a microservice receives, every single a query that a database receives, every single request or, or, or PR check uh, or every single PR that's made in a CI pipeline, all of those actions need to check against authorization policies. And so one of the key design principles around OPA is that you should be able to get those, the, those authorization decisions without having to hop over the network to get them. So if you're running microservices, uh, you want every microservice to be able to go ahead and get a policy decision without having to jump over the network. Um, and so OPA was designed to allow you to run it um, uh, as a daemon or as a sidecar or even embed it into your services uh, so that you can simultaneously sort of decouple and, uh, and, and apply this sort of unified approach to, to authorization. But at the same time, you get the same availability and performance results that you would had you left it sort of left those authorization policies hard coded into the into the into the software system. So at the end of the day, what this sort of illustrates, if you just sort of don't think too hard about it, is that you've got many different copies of OPA running. Like in a microservice world, you would have one copy of OPA running on every server. So you might have, if you have 500 instances of your microservices, you might have 500 instances of OPA. And now what that begs the question of is, well, how do you manage all of those different pieces of software? How do you make sure that uh, all the OPAs are, are properly downloading uh, policy? How do you make sure that they're healthy? How do you make sure they're making the decisions that you want? Um, and so that's where the second piece of software that at Styro we built comes comes into the picture. Um, you know, some, some folks will go ahead and build that stuff themselves, but uh, but what a lot of people like is a ready-made solution for this. And so, uh, so that's what the Styro Declarative Authorization Service provides. It's a, it's a single pane of glass, it's that control plane, it's that management plane uh, for all of the different OPAs uh, that you might be wanting to use, regardless, uh, regardless where those OPAs are deployed or what use cases those OPAs are deployed to solve. Okay, 
So uh, a few words here about, about OPA and the community around it. I think this is always uh, interesting for folks. So we started OPA at Styra back in 2016. Uh, and then a couple of years later, we donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Once you donate to the CNCF, there's a, a ladder of, of maturity that you go through. The, you start at Sandbox, so that's what's said there in 2018. About a year later, we, we moved up, the, uh, up that ladder to the incubating level. Uh, and then a year or a year and a half or maybe two later, we moved ahead to graduate. So graduated is the, the, the top of the ladder. Um, that's where the, the mature projects inside the CNCF exist. And so that's where projects like, um, like Kubernetes, Prometheus, Envoy, and the like um, all sit. So a couple of important things to call out here, one of which is that you know, if, if we look at the broad spectrum of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and the landscape there, there, there are a tremendous number of projects and the list is growing every day. OPA is the only graduated project uh, that is designed for solving policy and authorization problems. It's the only project within the CNCF that I know of uh, that is focused on uh, full stack policy. So giving you a unified solution to policy across many different kinds of, of software systems. Um, if you're interested in, in contributors, I'd say go ahead and check out uh, the CNCF dev stats. Uh, they've got a nice portal there to, to, to look at stats. Um, there in the middle there, we've got that growing community. So I, you know, there is a, an active uh, community that's growing. So definitely hop on Slack. Uh, there are plenty of folks who are interested in policy uh, that you can chat with directly. And then, uh, you know, anytime I think about the uh, a new open source project, one of the things I like to do is go and chat with, or at least hear from uh, some some end users who have, you know, deployed OPA and are using it, and they, you know, they can talk about the sweet spots and the rough edges. Uh, so I always like to point people at uh, sort of the last physical KubeCon that we had, and that was back in 2019. There just happened to be a good uh, sort of like a dense collection of talks uh, that cover different use cases on OPA. Um, so, so there, uh, I'll rattle a couple of these off real quick. So um, Yelp uh, was looking at microservices. I think Google and Goldman were applying it to Kubernetes in a couple of different ways. Uh, Reddit was also applying it to Kubernetes sort of the mission control. Um, and then oh, I'll also mention um, there was for the first time the OPA summit as uh, so we had it held like a half day uh, uh, summit where we had end users come and talk about how they're using OPA and that was a lot of fun. We're hoping to do that again sometime soon. So Cap One, Capital One there is talking about using it for Kubernetes. Chef embedded OPA deeply into their application. Um, Pinterest applied it to uh, Kafka as well as microservices. Uh, and they actually had two or three maybe uh, even uh, use cases that they applied it to. TripAdvisor with Kubernetes, Atlassian was microservice authorization as well. So definitely if you wanna hear from, um, from end users, I would, I would recommend you go check that out. Check out some of the talks in that, in that KubeCon. Okay, so one of the questions is, you know, from a technical point of view, why do so many people seem to uh, use and apply OPA uh, to solve these different use cases? Well, one of which is that, you know, OPA can be applied across the, the cloud native stack. And so it's, it's you know, universality is, is certainly a draw. Um, but, the, but the sort of next level down from that um, is, is some of, is, is OPA's architectural flexibility. So OPA was designed, like I said, to, to effectively run as a host local cache of any of the policies or, or even data that are needed to make authorization decisions. Um, but at the same time, OPA was designed uh, so, that you, so that it had quite a bit of flexibility architecturally. And so uh, there are, uh, some people like to run OPA sort of as a CLI um, and, 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 they're, uh, and, and that's a great way to go. Some people like to embed OPA inside of their service uh, and that's fine too. Some people, uh, probably the most popular, if I had to guess, uh, way of using OPA is to run it as a sidecar or as a daemon, uh, right, uh, right next to, effectively think of it as a separate process that's responsible for authorization, but that is nevertheless co-located with that service. Um, and then finally, you can, uh, OPA is a great building block, so you can go ahead and build a centralized service uh, out of it, and some people have. Um, and so that's sort of this third option here. So there's quite a bit of architectural flexibility, and that's part of why you can deploy it and apply it to so many different real world use cases and, and integrate it with so many different pieces of software because every piece of software has slightly different needs when it comes to availability, performance, and consistency. But the second thing that OPA provides that a lot of people love is the fact that um, you can compose policies, that the policies that you can write um, are also pretty flexible. So you can write policies that, that handle you know, Linux SSH and, uh, and Kubernetes admission control and microservice authorization, and all that's fine and great. 
but you can also build multiple policies and have multiple teams build separate policies and then compose them together. Uh, and so that kind of flexibility is great. And so, you know, one of the one of the things that this allows you to do is store all of the different teams policies into a Git repo or whatever source control you're using. And then what you end up doing is figuring out how to map all of those different policies uh, into the OPAs regardless what, where they're running. So you could use a common library uh, for five or 10 or 50 different use cases and just sort of copy or map that common library into all the different OPAs. Um, so the other thing that uh, a lot of people like about OPA is that it's management, how you sort of do that mapping from all the policies that exist into all of the OPAs uh, that are actually enforcing policy is really up to you. And, and, and OPA provides some building blocks for that, of course. Uh, but but um, but there are uh, but there is plenty of flexibility in terms of how you manage OPA. And so you can tailor that to your to your needs. Um, obviously, we have this ready-made at Styra, this ready-made solution to the, the management of OPA uh, to give you that single pane of glass. Uh, some people like that too, and we'll, we'll go through how you can use that here today. Now, if I zoom in a little bit on, on, that, uh, on that DAS uh, and on, the, on those sort of management challenges, um, you know, I, I think I like to break them down into really two categories. So the first category of things that you need to think about when you're, when you're rolling out OPA is really this idea that um, there's an entire policy lifecycle management uh, that you need to think about. So, you know, one of the nice things about OPA is it, it, it does give you this policy as code approach to, uh, to writing policy. Uh, so, you know, you store policies in a, in, a, in a dedicated file format, you can test them, you can uh, then deploy them and monitor them just like a standard SDLC. Uh, but here we're focused on policy. Um, and so all, all of those different uh, pieces of the life cycle are things that, that you need to think about that OPA enables, but that at the end of the day, uh, from a management perspective, you need to think about how you're gonna roll that out for, for, your, for your company. And obviously uh, the Styre DAS uh, makes all of that pretty easy. We aim to give you a vertically integrated solution to policy lifecycle management um, that, that works all together, but that you could you know, use your own um, pieces of that if you so desire. The second ca category of of challenges that you'll want to think about when you're think, when you're thinking about rolling out OPA is what what I'll call here enterprise governance. So I just think about this as teams, right? So policy is one of these things that I think even more so than traditional programming languages uh, are, are really defined by a broader team within the enterprise. So you think about not just the person who is enforcing the policy as contributing to that policy, but also you've got the man their managers and the security and compliance. Uh, there's a there's a broader range, I would argue, of of folks who are responsible for those policies uh, than there typically is for traditional for traditional code. So uh, so in that sense, uh, there are a bunch of team based uh, challenges that you need to think about. You know, every time you uh, want to update a policy or tighten a policy, how do you let the, all the teams know that that depend on it? Um, how do you collaboratively define policy so that uh, you know potentially one policy overrides another? Uh, how do you gain visibility into just you know the, the 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 last slide? Where how do you know which policies are deployed to which OPA? How can you be sure that the right policies are enforced um, in the right places? Um, and and then and then I'll even call out sort of this this challenge of uh, of thinking about how how dynamic a lot of the modern development teams are, and the fact that. Um, and, and the fact that so many times we see, you know, teams change over time uh, quite quickly. And what you'd like is to have a sustainable way of, of ensuring that the policies and the framework for enforcing policy uh, that, you, that you can put in place with OPA uh, outlives uh, the, the folks who brought that, that technology into the company. So anyway, those are, two, those are the two high level kinds of categories of, of challenges that, that people run into when they're thinking about deploying OPA. And, and obviously those are things that we address in the, in the DAS. The last thing I wanna say here just in slides before we hop over and, and start looking at a, a demo is really this idea that you know, OPA can be deployed and has been deployed to solve a wide variety of use cases as you, as you saw a few slides ago. Um, and, in, and so what we've seen is that some of those are, are, are incredibly popular, you know, applying OPA to solve Kubernetes admission control problems or, or Terraform um, risk management or uh, microservice authorization with Envoy. But those are three of the most popular um, use cases for OPA. Others exist and, and, and more will grow over time, but 
But those are very, very popular today. And so one of the things that we know is that providing and making those use cases especially easy and especially smooth is, is valuable for a lot of folks. And so what you also see as we, as we chat about using the DAS to help manage OPA is that we have built specialized support for each of these three leading use cases into, um, into the DAS. And so if those are high on your list of, of things that you wanna solve, then uh, the DAS may be, um, uh, th these features may look especially attractive to you. All right. All right, so good. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and look at a bit of a, a, a demo and, and I'll talk a little bit through sort of how uh, you might wanna think about managing OPA uh, using using the DAS and how you get started. So uh, what, what you're looking at here is is uh, sort of a demo version of, of the DAS. The DAS runs as a, as a SaaS offering. It's also, also available on premise. But the idea at the end of the day is how do you manage all the OPAs uh, that you might be using or wanting to use to solve authorization problems across the enterprise. How do you provide a single pane of glass? How do you help people write, deploy, manage policy? Uh, it's sort of an end-to-end -end solution for uh, authorization in this cloud-native world. So uh, the first thing you'll see here is over at the left, you'll see uh, a bunch of different icons under this title systems. So remember, there are a number of slides that we've shown where you, know, you can deploy OPA for all these different kinds of use cases. So one of the first things that we we do in the pro in the DAS is uh, give you a representation of those real world systems right here in the DAS. So each one of these different um, uh, systems, as we like to call them, uh, map to a real world software system. So in this case, the little blue wheel icon there represents a Kubernetes cluster. So we've connected up three different Kubernetes clusters here uh, into the product, and then you see uh, let's see one, two, three different Envoy. Uh, that little purple icon is Envoy. So we've got three different fleets of Envoy microservices hooked in. And then there are a couple of these purple icons. That's Terraform. So there are a couple of Terraform um, installations that we're ma managing here as well. And the last one that you'll see here is this, this, um, is this OPA icon. So that's the gray one. Uh, so that's really this, this sort of catch-all. You can use uh, the, the DAS, like I said, to manage any OPA. Um, and, and that's what that OPA icon represents. It's a system where we don't really know whether uh, what the use case is, but somebody has decided uh, that they need that they're that they've integrated OPA, and so therefore they need a, a sort of a, a way of of managing the policies that are designed for that real world system. So anyway, so this gives you a, a, you know that single pane of glass. If you want to understand which policies are deployed to which real world systems, well, here you go. Uh, you can go ahead and and poke around at. Uh, you can expand the internals of the, each one of these systems and see what policies are deployed. Now, what you'll also see here is uh, the sort of default view. Every every product's got a dashboard. This one's this one's ours. Uh, it's really showing all the decisions that OPA is making down on this Kubernetes cluster. So here, I, I haven't shown you how to set all this up yet, but imagine that you've got OPA deployed, you've got policies that are in place, and now uh, OPA is making decisions. And so here, we're seeing uh, those decisions being made. Uh, here for Kubernetes, it turns out there are two kinds of decisions that get made. One are called validating decisions. So that's just like an allow deny. Uh, is this resource safe to deploy. Uh, and then there's a mutating uh, the policy decision that gets made. And those are actually saying, well, you know what, somebody's trying to create a new ingress or a pod or whatever on the on the cluster. Um, and, and it's not really safe to deploy, but you know what, if we make this little change, if we mutate that resource, then it can safely be deployed. And so that's what you're seeing here. So greens here are just basically allows, they're just saying, you know, go ahead and, and, and this, this resource is ready to go. Uh, the blue is representing denies, so this resource is just unsafe to deploy, so we're going to block it. Uh, and the purple represents mutation uh, for the most part. So, uh, so that's kind of what you see there. Um, what we also see is like, sort of latency over time. You know, that's, depending on the use case, latency is more or less important. Here you're seeing, uh, you know, 15, 10, 10 20 milliseconds, um, which is, is, is certainly fine for, for a Kubernetes use case. For other use cases, you know, like a microservice use case, you want to see that number down, you know, at, at, at a couple of micro, a couple of milliseconds, I should say, um, uh, to be happy. But anyway, so this is what you'll kind of see at the end of the day, once in fact, you've got OPA configured, we'll go through how you set this up in, in just a moment. Um, but the other thing that I, that I want to show here is that these time series are not just aggregates. Um, if you really want to see uh, the individual decisions that OPA is making. And that's certainly important for audit. It's certainly important for, 
for debugging and so on. You can click over into this decisions view. So all these decisions are being uh, streamed uh, from OPA up to the DAS, and and they allow you as a as a as a user to sort of understand what decisions are being made. Um, you can this looks like a standard Apache style log, but if you go ahead and click one of these, what you'll see is that all the logging is done in JSON, uh, and this is really useful because now what what it means is that there is a machine understandable uh, log. And so one of the things that I'll call out here is that that log includes the input that was handed over to OPA. That input uh, has all the gory details in this Kubernetes use case um, that, that uh, of exactly what resource and how it was configured that the end user is trying to deploy onto the cluster. So in this case, it happens to be a pod. Um, and we can see it has something to do with Nginx in here. So all of that input is stored. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but importantly, it's what I like to call high fidelity JSON log. So completely um, automatable, scriptable, analyzable. Uh, we're not, we're just painting those, painting a picture here that makes those, all those log entries easy to read for, for us human beings. Okay, so those are the decisions that are getting made. Um, and again, once you've got open installed, um, it, it's useful to kind of see what policies are put in place. That's kind of what you're trying to do at the end of the day anyway. And so to see, we'll just take a look at the validating uh, port part of the, the policies. So remember the validating policies are the ones that are just saying uh, to either allow or deny a new request onto the cluster. All right, so here's, uh, there are actually a couple of different ways to look at the policy um, that is that is being enforced on this Kubernetes cluster. Here's one of them. This is sort of the what we call the swim lanes view. The idea here is that there, each of these cards represents a different rule that um, that the Kubernetes administrator wants to enforce on this cluster. So for example, prohibiting um, prohibiting containers from running as root, that's a popular one. Uh, prohibiting uh, on ingress, prohibiting host, or uh, prohibiting uh, path conflicts and hosts. Um, that's actually a funny one where, you know, if you, if you misconfigure a, a pair of ingresses so that they end up having, being configured with the same host name, then one can end up stealing traffic from another, depending on how the, the, the internals of, of that uh, ingress are, are, are implemented. Uh, and so what a lot of people like to do is to say that anytime somebody cr tries to create a new ingress on the cluster, to go ahead and check that there's not another ingress that is gonna conflict with that host. Um, and so that's a kind of an interesting policy just because it's not, it, while it is simply uh, making an allow deny decision, it's also uh, making a context aware decision. It's making a decision uh, that takes into account the state of the world. And the state of the world in this case is what's the existing set of ingresses and how are they configured and using that information to make an allow deny decision about a new ingress that's about to be um, uh, launched onto the cluster. What you'll also notice about this swim lanes view is that there are these three swim lanes, three columns, unused, monitored, and enforced. And so the idea here is that each rule you can put in one of these three modes and you can drag and move these rules around as you like. Um, the idea behind enforced is obviously we'll block a, a resource, stop it from making its way into the cluster uh, if the rule is violated. Monitored says, well, don't block it actually, but go ahead and return a, a, a warning message to the user so that they know that this is not uh, the behavior that we want, but it's not going to be blocked at this point in time. And then unused, just sort of disabling these, these rules, uh, which is sometimes useful. All right, so that's kind of the swim lanes view, uh, but keep in mind that, especially if you haven't seen um, uh, OPA before, that all of this is simply a, a GUI way of looking at and helping you to write the policy as code that OPA provides um, uh, uh, pol policies. And so here what you see is a different view of the same exact policy. Here though, instead of just seeing these cards, you see each card mapped to the actual code, the actual policy as code. This is Rego's, this is Rego, which is OPA's policy language. Uh, and so there's a one-to-one -one mapping here between each of these rules. And the, and the cards over here on the side. Um, now, one thing that's kind of powerful is that uh, what you can do, what we can do with Kubernetes, uh, unlike some of the other use cases, is we know uh, what some of the common policies are uh, that people want to, to put in place. And so here, I'll go ahead and, and put a new rule in place. Here, um, this one, I'll go ahead and enforce it. And this, this one is saying require labels uh, to be uh, to exist on all the resources. So, you know, if, uh, um, so labels in Kubernetes are very much like, you know, tags in, 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 in the public cloud. So uh, certain labels exist. Often this is important for, for chargeback or for ownership, for operations as well as security. 
Um, so anyway, have, putting a, a new rule in place requires all of these different uh, resources to get deployed on a cluster to show up uh, and to have these labels. Um, now, what I've done there is I've made a change to the policy. Um, and so one of the things that is kind of powerful is that, or one of the things you might want to think about is really this question of, well, uh, what's going to happen if I, um, what's going to happen uh, before I go ahead and, I, sorry, I'd like to know what's going to happen to this policy uh, before, uh, before I actually put it into place. And so there are a number of tools. Uh, I'll, I'll come back and show you that a little bit later. There are a number of tools uh, that we can use to, to go ahead and do that and to sort of ask that question. Well, what, what is going to happen um, um, when I deploy this policy? Like, I'd love to see uh, some, of the, some of the results uh, of that before I, I put it into place. So one of, the, one of the ways that we can do that is by looking at this compliance screen. The idea behind the compliance screen is that there are really two ways of using those policies. The, the first way to use a policy is really to enforce it at the point in time at which Kubernetes, the API server, receives, receives um, a new request for a new resource. Um, and, that, and that new resource is really going to, uh, and so the API server at that point is going to sort of ask OPA, hey, you know, what is going on? Uh, is this new resource safe to be deployed or not? Um, and, so, uh, and so they don't make a decision, is this safe or not? But a completely separate application of those policies would be to sort of like scan the cluster and ask the question of, of uh, and ask the question, well, look, um, you know, show me all the resources that exist on that cluster and tell me which, one, uh, which ones are going to violate that uh, violate my policies. And so that's what that compliance screen was doing. It looked like it was spinning there for some reason. So, so uh, we'll skip showing that to you. But all that's gonna do is it's gonna scan the cluster. It's gonna run the resources on the cluster against the policies that, that you've configured. And then it'll spit out a list of decisions. Uh, it'll spit out a list of resources that are gonna violate that policy. So you can kind of do that during policy editing uh, as well and sort of get that, get that feedback about, hey, if I were to put this crazy rule in place, you know, which, how many resources are going to be violating that rule? Um, all right. So anyway, so that's kind of the, the, a bit of the story. You can, you can write policies. You can, you can enforce them. Um, you can go ahead and do a little bit of what we like to call impact analysis to understand, um, is it the case, you know, how safe is it to deploy this new policy before we go ahead and deploy it? Um, and then you can also scan clusters to understand with those same policies, um, you know, which of the which of the current resources are violating uh, those policies and and often um, uh, and sometimes what happens uh, uh, is that, you know, you try you put new rules in place after resources already exist on the cluster. And so we're not going to eject those those existing resources from the cluster. Um, instead, uh, they'll, they'll just live there. Uh, and then if the once the application team gets to the point where uh, they're ready to to upgrade that resource to match the, the policies, then then they can go ahead and do that. Um, all right. Now, I promised that I would show you a, a little bit about how to get uh, this all started. And so uh, to do that, uh, we try to make that pretty easy here. So here for Kubernetes, and this is true for all the system types. I'll go to some of the other system types in a little bit. Um, you can go ahead and click on settings uh, and then install. So the first thing that you would typically do when you create a new one of these systems is you would install OPA and you'd install the other uh, you'd effect, effectively install OPA. Uh, yeah, uh, you'd effectively install OPA um, uh, as an admission controller, typically, um, and then you would put the policies in place and would start enforcing them. And so, uh, really, installing um, installing OPA on your cluster is pretty easy. It's it's two kubectl commands. Now we give you a couple of options here. You know, kubectl. Some folks like to use Helm or Helm three. Uh, Customize is another option as well. But as you can see, we sort of packaged all this together uh, so that you can go ahead and, and deploy it pretty easily. Uh, I see we have a question. Um, can OPA be used to configure a role-based RBOC policy for Kubernetes pod access? Uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, you can certainly apply OPA um, to solve uh, either admission control problems within, a, within the Kube API server, or uh, I was just talking to somebody the other day that said that they were applying OPA as an authorizer, right? So to sort of Instead of using the Kubernetes RBOC, uh, you can go ahead and use OPA to, to implement authorization or RBOC for, for Kubernetes as well. So 
Uh, in fact, uh, what maybe I should do is bring up a quick diagram. I think I've got one here. Oh, I, don't have a, I don't have a great, I don't have the one I was hoping for. But um, so here's a, well, this is too high level. Well, anyway, so within the API server, um, the idea is that there are actually several phases. There's um, there's authentication, who are you? Um, there is authorization, which is RBOC. And then after that, there's admission uh, control. And so, and actually it's validating or mutating and then validating admission controllers. So you can use OPA for validating admission control, for mutating admission control. And we don't do it, we don't have um, native support in the in the DAS today for it, but you can also deploy OPA for, for authorization. Um, not in, I'm not a hundred percent sure that's what you're asking here. It'll be used to configure a role-based RBOC policy for Kubernetes pod access. Um, but but if it's, if it's if that doesn't answer your question, you know, ask ask me again. Okay, so this is kind of the install setup, and then once once that's installed, uh, then you're pretty much up and running. You go ahead and put rules in place, um, and then once you've got those rules in place, um, you start seeing. Um, these kinds of results uh, that you see here in the dashboard and the decision log. All right, so that's kind of the Kubernetes version of this. Um, and now I wanna, I wanna show you a little bit about uh, another one of these system types, uh, because what you'll see is that there's a lot that's gonna be in, uh, shared. Uh, there'll be a lot that's, uh, uh, that you'll see that's very similar. Uh, so if I click on, uh, on this um, microservices, um, example, uh, what, we'll, what we'll eventually see is the same kind of thing. We'll see that same kind of dashboard. We'll see, um, we'll see the same kind of dashboard, the same kind of policy authoring experience. Uh, it seems to be a bit glitchy this morning. See if I can get somebody to, to fix it here live. Um, uh, let's see if any of these others are happy. All right, so let's just stay to them. So, so what, what one of the things you'll see uh, under under Envoy here is that you'll see the same sort of dashboard. You'll also see the same kinds of decisions show up. Um, but but then when it comes to policy authoring, uh, whereas here we had this list of pre-built rules because it's Kubernetes and we know it's Kubernetes. Like, you know, when we build the DAS, we know it's Kubernetes and therefore we know what kinds of rules to put in place. Uh, with the microservice use case, um, it's really one of these cases that uh, we don't know, right? We don't know what your APIs are. We don't know exactly how to um, provide a list of pre-built rules because at the end of the day, it's your API. Um, we, can, we can provide maybe helpers that, that, help you, uh, that help you understand, you know, for Envoy, the, the input scheme is quite a bit different. Um, and so what we can do here, let me illustrate this. So uh, the input schema for Envoy is quite a bit different uh, than Kubernetes. And so um, I guess I can't even pull up the input schema for, for the kube now. But, um, uh, but anyway, the schema is quite different. And so what we can do with, with Envoy is provide a list of helpers. Helpers that say, you know, is this method a get, a put, a post? Um, is it something that, um, is this, you know, pull out the jot out of the headers? Because there's usually a pretty standard place that you'll see the jot included in the headers. Um, you know, pull out the path and sort of pre-process it so that, uh, you know, if somebody's trying to write a policy that says, you know, all gets on, you know, slash foo slash bar uh, are authorized uh, as long as a user belongs to group, you know, engineering. Uh, then you know you can uh, you can write that pretty helpfully. So you know that's one of the the, the basic ideas uh, that we have in place is that it, different kinds of use cases require slightly different help when it comes to policy authoring. Um, but in large part, you know, ninety percent of the functionality that you need for Kubernetes is also something that you need for uh, for Envoy and for Terraform. And so that's kind of the overall idea behind the product is that. Um, you know, authorization is authorization. There are some details that, that are differ uh, for Kubernetes. You know, what, I, what was it, 10, 20, even 100 milliseconds for making decisions is certainly fine. Um, but but uh, for, for microservices, uh, the kind of policy performance that you want to see is probably more like a millisecond. Um, and so, uh, so there are details that differ from use case to use case. But nevertheless, 
um, a lot, a, a, a tremendous amount of the functionality is the same across all these different use cases. All right. So one of the thing I wanted, to, one other thing I wanted to mention here was uh, a couple of, of pieces around policy authoring. So um, one of which is that here we kind of have this idea that you've got three independent uh, Kubernetes clusters. And the idea being that each cluster may need different policies put in place. We routinely see people that say, hey, I've got a dev cluster and a prod cluster, and obviously I'm gonna be far stricter about the resources and the configuration that goes into the prod cluster than I am for the dev cluster. And so you actually do want to have the ability to control the policies that exist on each of these clusters separately. Same way, same thing is true with, with microservices. Uh, you're gonna want to have control over exactly the policies that go into each of those different microservice fleets. At the same time, however, there are often organization-wide mandates that should apply across all of these different Kubernetes clusters or across all of these different microservice clusters or Terraform installations. Uh, and so that's what this stacks feature is really all about. The idea there is just that a stack is sort of a global policy. It says, you know what, here's some policies uh, that should apply across multiple different, uh, what we call DAS systems. And so the idea here is that you put your policies into a stack. And then what you also do is use sort of a label selection logic to dictate which of these, to, to dictate which of the systems uh, up in this area up here are, are going to be um, uh, applied, uh, the policies that are written here. And so the idea is that each of these individual systems you can apply labels to, that's what you see here. Um, and then each of the, each of the stacks uh, says, well, you know, um, uh, let's say this stack is about PCI, uh, and maybe there's another stack about, uh, you know, the, the, the European Union. And so, you know, you put the policies for Euro the European Union in one stack, you put the uh, policies for PCI in another stack, and then what you do is for each of these clusters, maybe you, you, maybe some of the clusters are labeled, you know, PCI, some are labeled EU, and then some are labeled with both EU and PCI. And so in this way, uh, you get to sort of manage policies that apply across multiple multiple systems. Um, certainly when you get to more than three, you know, you're talking 50 or 100 clusters, uh, that kind of functionality becomes especially valuable. Now there's another kind of feature that I'll mention here, which is libraries. The idea behind libraries is that it's, it's another way of sharing policies across different systems. Uh, but unlike stacks, which are sort of forcibly applied, where, where the policies in a stack are forcibly applied to the appropriate systems up above, the libraries are more like programming language libraries. They're things that the different policy authors within each of these systems can opt into. Uh, and so think of this as just, you know, if you, if you wanted uh, to, to provide, if, if different teams uh, for Kubernetes or microservices were, were uh, having to rewrite um, the same kind of logic for, let's say, extracting and validating a, a, a user token, uh, then you could pull that logic out. You could have one team, you know, write that logic put it into a library, and now you could give that to all of your end user teams and just say, hey, uh, if you don't wanna write this, uh, go ahead and, and use the, the policy that's here, uh, the, 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 that's been pre-written for you. Um, so that's pretty powerful. The other thing I'll mention here uh, that I won't bother showing you is that, you know, we do think more, we do think quite a bit about how, despite the fact that this is a, an end-to-end -end solution for open management, uh, we do try to think a lot about how to make this work with uh, existing workflows for, for the, that people have already in, in, their, in their environments. Uh, and so one of the ways that we do that today is that we allow all of these different policies uh, that are brought up to be stored in Git. You know, so bring your own uh, uh, Git uh, to source control all of these policies. And then uh, all you have to do is sort of configure uh, the DAS here to store and retrieve policies from from that from whichever Git uh, Git branch or tag that, that you so desire. And then the idea is that this uh, policy authoring experience you you can use if you like. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a choice, and other people can choose to write policy in a in VI or VS Code. Um, and so it's really up to each individual as to how they want to write policy. At the end of the day, those policies are all stored in Git, uh, and then when it comes to deploying those policies the DAVs will just go ahead and track main or master, um, and then it'll just go ahead and deploy whatever policies exist in that branch. And then that way, 
uh, you get to sort of integrate uh, the, the, the use of this as one of many potential authoring interfaces for policy. All right, so I think I will uh, wrap it up there and just turn this over to see if anybody has any more, any more questions for us. No more questions? All right, well, sounds good. Um, so uh, by the way, uh, I guess I didn't mention this. I should bring this last slide up. If you uh, want to find out more, uh, definitely check out the openpolicyagent.org. Uh, that's the, the property owned by uh, by the CNCF, uh, but that we're maintainers and creators of. Um, and then there's also styro.com. Uh, so you can check us out there. That's the, the us as a commercial company. Uh, and that's where you can sign up for free and, and try out the DAZ if you like. Uh, and then definitely hit me up on Twitter if you, if you have any follow-ups or questions that, that you didn't get answered here. All right. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, it, was, it was a pleasure. I hope you all had fun.